classes have just begun at the University of Wisconsin. On a quiet, sunny day like this, it's hard to imagine that this corner of campus was once the site of bloody riots. But four decades ago, the era of civil disobedience and protest at the UW was kicked off when students occupied the Commerce Building to protest Dow Chemical's role in the Vietnam War. It's documented in David Marinus's book, They Marched Into Sunlight. I was a freshman at Wisconsin that fall, and the Dow demonstration crystallized for me the sort of the cultural change when I saw, uh, standing on the sides of of that event when I saw the police come in and I saw heads come out bloodied, I realized that something, you know, was changing in the country. In the time leading up to the 1968 election, most Americans had turned against the war in Vietnam, and support for the president was at a historic low. In 2008, attitudes toward the war in Iraq and the president matched those of 40 years ago. Yet the UW and other campuses are quiet. To explore why this is, we went back to the site of those anti-war protests. It's good footage. We brought along an iPod loaded with this footage from the late 60s. Um, so what do you think? That was crazy. It was pretty intense. Yeah. yeah. So you recognize where it's from? It was it's right here. Right, right here, right? Yeah. Eskimo. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> to these students today, this form of aggressive political action seems difficult to comprehend. Former student activist and Madison Mayor Paul Soglin has one explanation. It's unfortunate to say it this way, but if there was a draft, uh, we would have opposition in the streets. I don't think many people are feeling the effects of the war, so then, you know, they're not trying to get involved as much. Most movements are, are a combination of idealism and self-interest, and that, that self-interest uh, of the draft forced everybody to think about the war in a, in a more visceral way every day. The fact that there is no military draft today is likely one reason why young people are not so visibly engaged in political activism as they were in the Vietnam era, but not the only one. In many other ways, this generation is equally idealistic or more so than ours was, and that it's unfair to, to characterize them as, as uh, lazy or disinterested or apolitical. I think that the forces of culture have changed, and it takes a different direction. One way culture has changed is how protest is viewed. They could probably know that there's a lot more effective ways to show their opposition nowadays street protesting and things like that, it seems to me, were somewhat new and radical, so I think it had a higher effect. The newness that was brought into people's living rooms in the 1960s is clearly gone. In fact, when there is street protest today, like at the recent political conventions, it is largely ignored by mainstream news organizations. But it can be found readily on websites like YouTube. The whole world of communications has changed. And that change has in turn changed how young people become politically involved. I would argue that there are different ways to approach uh, what student activism means. I think UW student Danny Spurn writes a popular campus blog, The Critical Badger. Certain things like the blogosphere is a 21st century form of political activism where students can get engaged in their dorm rooms, wearing their pajamas, they can talk about things they think is important. Through these weblogs, anyone with Internet access can have a voice in political discussion. And it's certainly not limited to young people. You know, the Internet provides all of us uh, an opportunity. Every night I can log on, write a post for my blog. Forty years ago, it would be a press conference. But the growth in blogging does not mean political activity has become limited to people home alone in their pajamas. Other new technology used by young people is quickly being adapted for political use. So-called social media, popular with young people, sites like Facebook, were created for groups of friends to stay connected. But the potential to connect with candidates and causes has been quickly realized. Text messages sent to cell phones are another rapidly growing technology used for political communication. But today, it's uh, the generational change is linked directly to the technology. The youth vote is potentially very powerful. That means candidates who want to get that vote will be using all the new tools young people use to communicate with each other. YouTube and texting and things like that 